Good evening. Good evening and welcome to our weekly worship service. My friends, our message series, remember, is called Living the Christ-like or the Christ-centered life. Living the Christ-centered life. And together we are learning how to live life with Christ at the center. A lot of people don't understand what the Christian life is all about. They think that Christianity is all about rules and regulations, that it is nothing more than a lot of do's and don'ts. But today's passage in Colossians make it clear that Christianity is not about that at all. Paul is saying, don't be taken in by a lot of man-made do's and don'ts. Christianity is not about rules. Christianity is about a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not about don'ts. It's about what Christ has done. Today we're going to look at three things that people try to put at the center instead of Christ. These are all tempting things to try and build your life around. But as we shall see, they are all poor substitutes for Christ. Let's look at Colossians. We're going to look at verses 16 to 23. Colossians chapter 2, verses 16 to 23. Verse 16 says, Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Shabbat day. These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinus, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish with use, are based on merely, merely human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. My friends, people are always tempted to substitute something for Christ. There seems to be something in the heart of man that rebels against this idea of living life with Christ at the center. Either we think Christ is the wrong solution or we don't think Christ is enough. But either way, we end up putting something else at the center instead of Christ. But there is no good substitute for Christ. Or should I say there are no good substitutes for Christ. Everything you need to live the Christian life is found in Christ. It's been said many times that bad theology leads to bad practice. And that is never more true than when we are talking about Christ and his place in the Christian life. Back in Colossians chapter 2 verse 8, Paul warned the Colossians about a deceptive philosophy that was threatening their lives with Christ. Now we get a more detailed description of what this false teaching at Colossae was all about. And through it all, Paul's message is clear. Don't substitute anything for Christ. Christ is central 
and anything you try and substitute for him is a poor substitute. There are three main issues that Paul addresses in our passage this evening. First, he addresses the problem of legalism in verses 16 to 17. Then he addresses the problem of mysticism in verses 18 to 19. And then finally, he addresses the problem of asceticism in verses 20 to 23. So let's take a look at each of these three in turn. Firstly, fighting legalism. Paul, first of all, talks about fighting legalism. Legalism is relying on religious rules for acceptance by God instead of what Christ has done for you at the cross. The danger with legalism is that people judge each other over things that no longer even apply. And so Paul gives the warning here, don't let anyone judge you. Don't let anyone judge you. Once again, my friends, legalism means or legalism is relying on religious rules for acceptance by God instead of what Christ has done for you at the cross. Let's look again at, at verse 16 of Colossians chapter 2. It says, therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration or a Shabbat day. The Colossians were allowing the false teachers to judge them, to intimidate them, to make them feel inferior because they were not observing the Jewish ceremonial law. However, as we saw last week, Christ has freed us from the power of the law to condemn. And Christ has fulfilled all aspects of the ceremonial law. The power of the law has been cancelled and you cannot be judged by a law that no longer exists for you. Paul is saying, don't let someone question your spirituality on the basis of religious rules rather than Christ. My friends, legalism always tries to add to the work of Christ. For the legalist, Christ's work on the cross is never enough. So instead of faith in Christ alone, it is always Christ plus works. But as soon as you add works into the picture as a means of acceptance by God, it is no longer by faith alone. Paul gives us two examples of specific work, works that the false teachers were trying to add to the work of Christ. A special diet and the observance of special days. Let's talk about the special diet first. When Paul says, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, he's talking about the ceremonial laws in the Old Testament. Laws that had to do with clean or unclean animals, fasting or not fasting, rules and regulations about wine for priests and the Nazarites, rules and regulations about drinking from an unclean vessel. But Jesus taught the people that the dietary laws of the Old Testament no longer applied. Speaking of food, Jesus said in Mark chapter 7, verse 14 to 15. Mark chapter 7, verse 14 to 15. This is what Jesus said. Listen to me, everyone, and understand this. Nothing outside a man can make him unclean by going into him. Rather, it is what that comes out of a man that makes him unclean. And we read in Romans 14, verse 17, where he says, where the word of God says, the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. And then back to Colossians chapter 2, verse 16, Paul says, don't let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink, or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Shabbat day. These were the special days that the false teachers were observing, religious festivals. 
right? And religious festivals probably refers to the annual Jewish festivals such as Passover, First Fruits, Pentecost, which we which they call it the Feast of the Week, the Feast of Weeks, the Feast of the Trumpets, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of the Tabernacles, all found in Leviticus chapter twenty-three. The pagans also observe sacred days. The new moon celebration was a monthly festival where sacrifices were offered at the new moon on the first day of the month. Numbers 10 verse 10, Numbers 28 verses 11 to 14. And then the Shabbat day would refer to the weekly Shabbat, although perhaps Paul has the annual Shabbat day in mind also. Leviticus 25 verses 1 to 3. My friends, at this time in history, the Jews and the Christians were already observing separate days for worship. The Jews worship on Saturday, the Shabbat, while Christians worshiped on Sunday, the Lord's Day. We read in Romans 14 verse 5, where it says, One man considers one day more sacred than, the, than, the, than another. Another man considers every day alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. Now, don't get me wrong. There's nothing wrong with eating special foods or observing special days. But we must understand that these are not requirements for any believer. And so Paul says, don't let anyone judge you according to what you eat or drink or with regard to special days. The problem, my friends, with these things is that they were only shadows of the things that were to come. Colossians 2 verse 17 says this, These are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. We read something similar in the book of Hebrews, in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 1, where the writer of the Hebrews says, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. A shadow, my friends, has no reality in or of itself. It only points to the reality of something else. In the same way, those things pertaining to the Old Testament, ceremonial laws, had no substance in themselves, but only as they related to the coming of Christ. And so, what is the solution to legalism? Instead of focusing on rules and regulations, focus on the reality which is found in Christ. Paul says that all these things were but shadows pointing to the fulfillment or reality which is found in Christ. But just as a shadow is absolutely dependent on the real object, so is the law. The law is absolutely dependent on Jesus Christ. So instead of focusing on ceremonial food, focus on Jesus who's the bread of life. Instead of focusing on religious festivals, focus on Christ who's our Passover. Instead of focusing on Shabbat days, focus on Jesus who's our eternal rest. A shadow, my friends, is temporary, but the reality is permanent. A shadow is a poor substitute for the real thing. Just try hugging a shadow. So how do you fight legalism? Focus on the reality which is found in Christ. So that's fighting legalism. Next, Paul talks about fighting mysticism. And if legalism is relying on religious rules for acceptance by God, instead of what Christ has done for you at the cross, mysticism is relying on religious experience for status within the church instead of finding your place in the body of Christ. The danger with mysticism is that people disqualify each other depending on whether or not they have had certain religious experiences. And so Paul gives the warning here. Don't let anyone, don't let anyone disqualify you. Once again, mysticism is relying on religious experience for status within the church instead of finding your place in the body of Christ. Look at verse 18 of Colossians chapter 2. 
where Paul writes, do not let anyone who delights in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you for the price. Such a person goes into great detail about what he has seen and his unspiritual mind puffs him up with idle notions. The word disqualify is a word that means to decide against someone or to give a judgment against someone. It is an athletic term that is related to the Greek word for empire. Paul is saying the false teachers were relying on their religious experiences to determine who really ranked in the church. And if you didn't have the same type of experiences they were having, just like an empire would say, you are out. You don't rank. You don't qualify. The false teachers were acting like self-appointed spiritual referees who were disqualifying the Colossians because they did not have certain religious experiences. Well, what kind of religious experiences were these false teachers having? Paul mentions two examples here. The worship of angels and visions. Now, you might wonder where the worship of angels comes from. Our best guess is that the false teachers thought that God was so far above us that we could only worship him through a series of angelic intermediaries. This grew out of their false teaching that physical or material things were evil. They responded that if our bodies were evil, we could not worship God directly. So we would need to use this series of angels in order to reach God. But there are two problems with this. First of all, this teaching denies Christ as the mediator between God and man. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, Paul says, There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is the only mediator you need between God and man, not a series of angels. And then the second problem is this. You're not supposed to worship angels. You should only worship God. My friend, Satan is a fallen angel. And when he tried to get Jesus to worship him in the wilderness, Jesus told him, away from me, Satan, for it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Matthew 4 verse 10. Well, Satan is a bad angel. What about the good angels? In the book of Revelation, when the, when the apostle John started to worship an angel, the angel told him, don't do it. I am a fellow servant with you and with your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Revelation 19 verse 10. It's interesting. History tells us that the worship of angels continued to be a problem in this area for centuries to come. In AD 363, a church synod in Laodicea had to address this issue. Where it states in Canon 25, where it states it is not right for Christians to abandon the church of God and go away to invoke angels. There are records that the Archangel Michael was worshipped in Asia Minor as late as AD 739. Of course, it's easy to pick on people in the past, but what about some of our focus on angels today? Some people are fascinated with all things angels and angel stories. They may not be actually worshipping angels, but if a focus on angels draw attention away from Jesus Christ, then something is not right. So the false teachers were worshipping angels and they were also having visions. These were probably visions brought on by the extreme fasting and ascetic practices that Paul discusses in the next section. They were obviously very proud about these visions because Paul says, they went into great detail about what they had seen. 
So the worship of angels and visions, these were both examples of mythicism, relying on religious experiences for one's status in the church. The problem with mythicism, Paul says, is that people who rely on religious experience display a false humility, which is really just pride in disguise. Paul says of such a person, his unspiritual mind puffs up with idle notions. My friends, the irony here is that is they thought they were being so spiritual when Paul says they were not spiritual at all. They thought they were super spiritual, but Paul says they are unspiritual. Now, don't get me wrong again. There is nothing wrong with religious experience in or of itself. It's only wrong when we compare, when we try to make our experience the standard for someone else's spirituality. Or when we make more of our experience than what Jesus has done for us on the cross. We also need to remember that religious experience does not, does not equal spiritual maturity. The true test of spiritual maturity is not what kind of experiences you have had, but rather knowledge of God's word leading to love for God and other people. The Apostle Paul had visions of heaven and angels, but he did not boast about them. Rather, he boasted about Christ. Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 5. Here's what he says. I will not boast about myself except about my weaknesses. So, if the problem with mysticism is false humility and pride, what is the solution? The solution, again, is to stay connected with Christ. Verse 19 of Colossians chapter 2 says this. He has lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinus grows as God causes it to grow. The solution is to stay connected with Christ from whom the whole body of Christ grows. The only way to grow as a Christian, my friends, is to stay connected with Christ. As Jesus said in John 15, John chapter 15 verse 4 says this, Remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the wine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. My friends, stay connected with Christ from whom the whole body grows as God causes it to grow. There should be no jockeying for position within the church based on our religious experiences. True spiritual growth comes from God, not from our experiences. Once again, Christ is central. So how do you fight mythicism? Stay connected with Christ. We have talked about fighting legalism. We have talked about fighting mythicism. And now finally we come to fighting asceticism. Asceticism. Well, if legalism is re relying on religious rules and mythicism is relying on religious experiences, what is asceticism? Asceticism is relying on religious acts of self-denial to grow in holiness. The danger with asceticism is that people take each other's freedom away by condemning things which God has called good. And so Paul warns us, don't let anyone take away your freedom. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 2 and let's look at verses 20 to 21. Here's what scripture says. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. Asceticism teaches that denying yourself leads to greater holiness and approval from God. Now, 
We are all called to deny ourselves and follow Christ, but not as a means of acceptance, acceptance with God or to grow in holiness. Paul says, you died with Christ to the principles of this world. Why are you still submitting to its rules as though you belong to it? As Jesus told his disciples in John 15, verse 19, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Now, my friends, once again, this had to do with the false teaching of dualism. The false teachers taught that material or physical things were evil. And we see this in the kinds of rules the false teachers were proposing. Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These are the basic rules of asceticism. The word handle is similar to the word touch, but it is a stronger word which means to touch or to grasp. It was used of both food and sex. So fasting from fruit and abstaining from sex are probably both in mind here. To taste, obviously, is to enjoy. And then the third word, touch, is a milder word for just touching something. So you notice the progression here in the false teacher's rules. Do not handle, do not taste, do not even touch. But the problem with all this is that these are merely human commands and teachings. Look at verses 22 to 23 of Colossians chapter 2. Paul says this, These are all destined to perish with use because they are based on human commands and teachings. Such regulations indeed have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, with false humility and the harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. What's Paul saying? These are not God's rules, but man's rules. They are all destined to perish. They have to do with material things that will pass away, which is especially true with food. You eat it, it's gone. None of these commands will carry on into heaven. There is no fasting in heaven. There will be no asceticism. Rather, we will experience the fullness of joy in God's presence. These commands have no eternal value because they are not based on God's word, but man's word. Paul says these rules look spiritual on the outside. They have an appearance of wisdom, but that's only if we buy into this whole dualistic mindset that material things are evil. But my friends, the material things of this world are not evil and meant to be avoided. They are good and meant to be enjoyed. That's what we, we read in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, where Paul says to Timothy, God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. We think people that, that, that we think that people who do these superhuman feats of self-denial must be super spiritual. But there is no real wisdom in asceticism. Colossians 2 verse 3, Paul says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden in Christ. Paul says, these rules are self-imposed and self-made worship. These are not God's requirements, but rather self-imposed requirements. God says in Isaiah 29 verse 13, Isaiah 29 verse 13, says, these people come near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is made up only of rules taught by men. Paul also speaks of their harsh treatment of the body. Ascetics have done some really strange things in the name of spirituality over the years. Some wore uncomfortable, thick hair shirts. I like how one person put it, as if itching was spiritual. Others isolated themselves, sleeping on hard beds, living in cramped quarters. Some whipped themselves 
or jumped naked into torn bushes. Others fasted for prolonged periods of time. There was one famous ascetic in the fifth century, Simeon the Stylite, who spent the last 36 years of his life living on top of a 50 foot pillar. So people have done some really crazy things in the name of asceticism. But Paul says it's all man-made rules. God never told you to do any of this stuff. But beyond all that, there is another problem with asceticism, which is simply this. It doesn't work. That's what Paul says about all these ascetic practices at the end of verse 23. This is what Paul says, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. My friends, really, think about it. What good does living on top of a pillar do you? The bottom line is this. Man loves to try to earn God's favor by works. We will choose penance over repentance anytime. But remember this. Religious acts of self-denial are merely human commands and teachings. They have an appearance of wisdom, but they don't actually work when it comes to growing in holiness. So what does work? The solution is to remember that you have already died with Christ to the basic principles of this world. Verse 20. Let's look at it one last time. Since you died with Christ to the basic principles of this world, why, as though you still belong to it, do you submit to its rules? You don't need to keep killing yourself through repeated acts of asceticism. Why? Because you already died with Christ. When you put your faith in Christ, you were united with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. You have already been given a new life in Christ. The answer is not more asceticism, but simply faith in Christ who died for you and remembering that by faith you died with him. As Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, verses 19 to 20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. My friends, there's a place for fasting in the Christian life, but never as a substitute for Christ. We don't need additional rules for the outside. We need Christ and the Holy Spirit on the inside. What's the solution for asceticism? Remember that you already died with Christ. In conclusion, People are always tempted to substitute something for Christ, but there are no good substitutes for Christ. Christ has everything you need to live the Christian life. And so once again, as we have seen all the way through this letter, Christ is central. The Christian life is not about religious rules, religious experiences, or religious acts of self-denial. Legalism, mysticism, and asceticism. These are all poor substitutes for Christ. My friends and family, as a Christian, you have already received fullness and freedom in Christ. You cannot add to what Christ has already done for you. It's like a glass of water that is filled to the brim. You can't add anything to it without spilling what's already inside. In the same way, you have received fullness in Christ. You cannot add anything else without taking away from what Christ has already done for you. True spirituality is not a matter of religious rules or religious experiences or religious acts, but rather a relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember, my friends, legalism cannot buy you acceptance with God. You are accepted by God through faith in Christ who came in fulfillment of the law. Mysticism brings division into the body of Christ. We need to stay connected with Christ, from whom the whole body grows together. Each person is vitally and equally important. 
Asceticism will not help you grow in holiness. Remember that you you already died with Christ to this world will. So what's today's message in a nutshell? Don't substitute anything for Christ. Keep Christ at the center. All other things are just poor substitutes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we reflect on the wisdom found in Colossians 2, verses 16 to 23, we are reminded of the freedom we have in Christ and the need to guard our hearts against false teachings. Lord, help us. Help us to stand firm in the liberty that Christ has secured for us, not allowing anyone to judge us or condemn us for our faith. May we not be swayed by empty traditions or human regulations that do not align with the truth of the gospel. Father, grant us discernment to recognize and reject the hollow and deceptive philosophies of this world. Keep us grounded in the sufficiency of Christ, that we may not be taken captive by vain speculations or legalistic demands. Lord, empower us empowers by your spirit to live in the reality of our new life in Christ, not according to the elemental principles of this world. May our focus remain on the supremacy of Jesus, the true head of the church. Father, we offer our worship and praise to you, our sovereign God. You alone are worthy of our devotion and trust. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. For those of us on social media, on Facebook and YouTube, we thank you for joining us this evening. Have a wonderful week. We'll see you all next week. For those on Zoom, please hold on as we continue our program. God bless you all.